Hello and welcome to Just One More Watch and welcome today to another Christopher Ward review, the second in the space of two months. Now, the last Christopher Ward was the most expensive Christopher Ward I have ever reviewed. This Christopher Ward is the least expensive Christopher Ward I have ever reviewed. In fact, it's the least expensive watch in their current catalogue. Now, I talked in my review of the 12X how Christopher Ward had been slowly but surely moving up in price, but also correspondingly up in quality and innovation. It's great to see though that they haven't forgotten their base with the release of this Valor chronograph. Now, the two watches arrived in Sydney at the same time early last month, so I've been wearing this Valor quite a lot. Why? Because I like it. And because I think it makes a pretty strong case for itself if you're looking for a Swiss made chrono under 1,000 US dollars well under a thousand US dollars. In fact, you have got options on this one starting from around 550 US dollars. Now, you saw the pop-up, I'm sure. This video is sponsored by Christopher Ward. I will therefore, of course, leave a link in the description of the video to the Valor on their website. Now, I have long maintained that Christopher Ward make the best watches you can buy for under 1,000 US dollars. Let's get into this one and see if that still holds true. And let's start by looking at the packaging. This is exactly the same packaging as featured on the 12X last month. Now, that means either the four and a half grand 12X was underpackaged or the $600 Valor is overpackaged. I will leave that up to you to decide. But this is some really nice all natural material, I believe. And of course, the watch comes with one of the best warranties in the business. 60-60, so 60 day returns and a 60 month movement warranty. Although I suspect you're not gonna need the movement warranty with this one. Christopher Ward were inspired by the British military watches of the 1980s. That's why they chose to use high polished silver numerals, apparently. It has a very similar look in that regard to the Hamilton Coupe, which had a similar style of Arabic numerals. They also chose to apply the twin flag logo in matching high polished silver, and it's all very symmetrical. Not something you could necessarily say with the Christopher Wards of old when they were insisting on putting the logo at nine o'clock for some reason best known to themselves. The dial is dominated though by those three big sub registers. Small second at six, 30 minute chrono timer at 10, and 10th of a second at the two o'clock. I'm sure you've already spotted, it's a quartz chronograph. And of course, a Swiss made watch needs a Swiss made movement, so the CW rather than a Seiko Mega Quartz or a Miyota, for example, has a thermal compensated ETA G10.212i. CW handily reminds you that it's a chronograph by printing the word near the eight o'clock in case you've forgotten. But more importantly, they also print the word chronometer near the four. Now for a quartz movement to be certified as a chronometer, it has to fall within a certain accuracy window. That window being plus or minus seven seconds per year. And the Pressy Drive version of this G10 does indeed do exactly that. Very, very impressive. All right, we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Let's get back to dimensions and specifications. This one is 39 mil in diameter, has a thickness of only 11.6, a lug to lug of exactly 45, 20 mil between the lugs. The consort bracelet as supplied here tapers down to around 17 and a half at the butterfly clasp and as sized to fit my seven inch wrist with the consort, it weighs in at 117 grams. Water resistance is 150 meters with a screw down crown. Glass is beveled edge flat sapphire crystal. And as discussed, the movement, let's just call it an ETA G10. Now this is one of Christopher Ward's signature light catcher cases in inverted commas. They developed this a few years ago and have rolled it out in a bunch of watches since then. It's a really nice shape. It has got a lovely profile and a fantastic mixture of brushed and polished surfaces that do indeed catch the light. So from bottom to top, we go polish, brush, polish, brush, brush, polish, brush. I said the sapphire was beveled, and you can see that quite clearly here. Not quite the same angle though as the bezel itself. 
Coming around to the other side, you'll find two nicely machined, unsigned, all brush chronograph pushers and a small but grippy crown etched with the same twin flag logo. Again, it's all really nicely done. You're certainly getting your money's worth in terms of the fit and finish and how this watch feels in hand. The military connection continues with the case back today with the insignias of the British Navy, British Army and Royal Air Force, plus the words approved for His Majesty's Armed Forces, emphasising that this is a brand new model. Personally, I'm still struggling to get used to the fact that there is now a king rather than a queen, and I'm sure I'm not alone. It's a really nice case back. Again, it looks good, it feels good, plus you can see quick release spring bars there, always a welcome addition. The bracelet, now they offer a couple of different bracelets, plus a canvas strap option if you want to go full mil spec and save a few dollars. This consort is the more complex and I think the dressier of the two. It's a proper five link with links two and four being high polished. Now the end links are male but they're angled so nicely and fit so well with the case that I think it enhances the fit rather than inhibits the fit. Now, despite the relatively slender size of those links, they are held together by screws rather than pins, and a couple of smaller links are also offered either side of the butterfly clasp to help with sizing because there ain't no micro adjusts on this one, nor has the adjustable butterfly clasp trickled down to this model quite yet. Christopher Ward brand name features for the second time because we saw it on the case back rather than the dial. Christopher on one side of the bracelet, Ward on the other side. Let's have another quick look at the dial and let's have a look at how the movement actually operates. No huge surprises. One push of the top pusher starts the central chronograph hand ticking once per second, but that sub register at the two, the red central hand also rotates once per second, meaning you can measure down to one tenth of a second as discussed. Now, that would suck the life out of the batteries, so it stops after a minute and you're left just with the chronograph hand and the second hand ticking away. You can also time lapse with this one. Just press the bottom pusher, you get a readout in minutes, seconds and tenths of a second, even though that register is actually marked down to one twentieth of a second. Once you've written that down, press the bottom button again and the watch will pick up where it left off as it were. The pusher action is really crisp and snappy, very nice indeed. We've had a look at the applied Arabics and logo already. The only thing we haven't really discussed are the sub registers and the hands. Now, those sub registers are big and they do rather dominate the dial, do they not? I think a good choice by CW to add just a tiny little bit of color. Apparently those three colors are meant to represent the three branches of the British Armed Forces, by the way. Now there's nothing necessarily wrong with monochrome, but it can look a bit drab. Even the merest bit of color always tends to give it a lift. Hands themselves are very Christopher Ward, high poly silver, bevel down the middle, and with a nice long minute hand and arrowhead hour hand. Chrono hand is also high polished, a super simple needle sitting exactly where it should be, right at the edge of the dial though, on that printed minute track. Having said that, those extra quarter second hash marks on that minute track aren't really necessary today, certainly not for the operation of the chronograph anyway. They might have been better in fact putting them on the second hand sub register instead. Down there you have to make do with markers on every fifth second where they could have squeezed in a few more, I'm sure. All right, on wrist. As I said, I've been wearing this one a lot because I like it. It's a really nice size, it's a nice shape, it's a nice weight, and that case is gorgeous. Now, this particular bracelet does encourage you to wear the watch loose, and that's what I've been doing. It's very comfy below the knuckle, for example. As discussed, though, you do have other options with this one, and your choice of strap or bracelet will have quite a large bearing, I think, on both how the watch looks and how it wears, so choose carefully. This consort has the most polish and is therefore the dressiest, and also in encourages the loosest of fits because of the lack of micro adjustment. Now I'm sure you can see clearly from these shots, those applied high polish Arabics do rather come and go depending on the angle and on the light conditions. The legibility of the silver hands also rather depends on angle and light conditions, more on that later. 
but definitely no comfort complaints. I wear my watches 24 seven, and this one has done several night shifts without difficulty. It's a lovely case design, and one I think would suit people with considerably smaller wrists than I have. All right, it's my favorite time other than dinner time. It's moans and niggles time. I have been enjoying the Valor a lot. It's a really easy watch to wear, and my personal preference these days because of my circumstances, is grab and go quartz. It's just so much easier when you have a vast and unruly collection like I do. But that doesn't mean to say I don't have a list of complaints because I do. I will not be complaining about quartz though. It helps keep the watch slim. It helps keep the price down. And who in the right mind would complain about 0.02 seconds per day accuracy? Not me. Now, I got the dressiest of bracelet options sent to me. This is a press prototype. If I was buying one of these, I think I'd be tempted to go for the more simple three-link bracelet instead. They call that the Bader. I think it probably suits the military look better than this multi-link one does. Plus, it's a little bit cheaper and has some built-in micro-adjustment. I have not shown you the loom yet, and you know what that means, don't you? It means the loom isn't up to much. Now, it's not awful. There just isn't an awful lot of it. There's loom on the two main hands, and there are tiny loom plots set into the minute track at the very outer edges of the dial. No loom, unfortunately, on those big applied numerals, though. So that means that when I turn the speed up, you're left with a fairly ordinary loom display, just the two hands, at least they last, but a bit more loom on the hour markers would not have gone amiss. And I did allude to this a couple of times over the course of the video, legibility can be a bit hit or miss. The numerals come and go depending on angle and light conditions, and the hands, whilst being a decent size, can occasionally get lost against those three rather dominant white subdials. Which I guess brings me to my final point today. As much as I enjoy this size, I can't help but think that this watch would look better just a little bit bigger, perhaps as a 40, a 41, or a 42. Just a bit more dial space, a bit more separation between those three large subdials and the numerals. And frankly, those subdials would then look a bit more in proportion if the watch did get bigger, if you see what I mean. Now, I am no good with Photoshop, but I know a man who is Glyn Reynolds' community stalwart and friend of the channel, and I asked him to tweak the Valor to test out my theory that it would look better as a slightly larger watch. So here is the 39, and here is Glyn's modified version. He actually went all the way up to 43, which might be a bit too big, especially for that lug width, but I think it illustrates my point. I'll go back and forth between the two a couple of times, and you can see what I mean. There's just a bit more space on the dial, and the dial therefore looks less dominated by those three big white sub-registers. So Christopher Ward, if you're listening, which perhaps I think you might be, I think there's an opportunity for you there to release a slightly bigger Valor, a 41 or a 42, something like that, a little bit further down the track. Think of all the extra sales. But overall, for the price they're asking, it's a really neat and tidy, well-made, well-finished watch from a brand that has more credibility with every passing year. And at 600 US dollars or thereabouts, I think it's pretty good value for money as well. It's back to Christopher Ward doing what they used to do every time, but now only do occasionally. So Christopher Ward, we all know you're on a trajectory into a different sector of the market than from where you began, with your bel canto, your apex, and your 12x. But please, don't forget about us value lovers. Can we please have more of these releases for under a grand US? The Valor may not be perfect, but it's bloody good, and it's great to see a non-Japanese brand making high quality but affordable quartz in 2024. So there you have it, not without a few moans and niggles. Legibility isn't amazing, and I think they could have definitely added another couple of mil, but it wears so sweetly as a 39. I'm sure it'll find some fans in that size. I think I've reviewed seven or eight Christopher Wards by now. If you want to see another one, click here or click here. Thanks for making it all the way to the end, and I'll see you again in the next one.